I want to start today by sharing something with you that goes back a little bit. But I, I want to like, you know, what do they say? Cut to the chase. During this podcast, we're going to cut to the chase and we're going to do it by first letting you listen to something, which is, uh, I think, a, a, a pretty cool moment. This is the way things used to be. Go. Chris. I know, dude. How cool is that? The Beaner and the Redneck. I laugh with, not at. But I make fun of his people, too, though. <laughs> <laughs> that segment became uh, the Beaner and the Redneck. That's Carlos Mencia <laughs> that you just saw right there. So when I had a show on CNN, as uh, many of you know, it was probably one of the most highly rated shows on CNN. And we did a lot of cool stuff. And we're the first show that ever came along. We actually even had a segment on that show called Las Fotos del Dia. It was the first time that somebody had had the balls to actually do a television show on CNN that talked about Latino issues, even spoke a little Spanish, invited Latino guests. And that particular segment, the uh, Beaner and the Redneck, that's Jeff Foxworthy, who's a good, good old friend of mine. He, he used to live in Atlanta. We used to do that show out of Atlanta. He lived just down the way in Atlanta. We would call him from time to time, and he would show up on the set. And then I had a good friend as well named Carlos Mencia, and he'd show up, and we'd do this thing between, well, the beaner and the redneck, as bizarre as that may sound. Joining us now, by the way, is uh, the beaner. <laughs> You made a mistake when you went Jewish, bro. That's when you made the mistake. <laughs> you, know, you know what's ironic about, about I, I won't talk about your situation, but I'll talk about Marlon Brando. Uh -huh. Back in the day, and I believe it was on CNN, he, yeah. he made the comments. It, it might have been on one of the, uh, yeah, but anyway, he said that, you know, the Jews control uh, the media, you know, are. are Mar the Marlon Brando? Thing. Marlon Brando said that? Yeah, he said something about the Jew, and then he I, had I to apologize that. for saying it. And I remember thinking, when Marlon Brando, overweight actor, who really doesn't care about anything, not even getting any work anymore, <laughs> is told to apologize, whoever those people are, are powerful to him. Yeah. And I said to myself, interesting that his statement kind of pr didn't prove anything, the reaction did. The well, fact that, you know what I'm saying? He got, he, he would, the fact that you were fired shows that what you were saying, there was some truth. Well, to it. I know. The, the funny thing, all, all my buddies who happen to be Jewish uh, would always say that to me. They'd say, darn it. Do, do we know what sucks about this? You said something, and then some people said some things about you, and then it ended up with you being fired. So it almost shows like, oh my God, is that true then what you're saying? And well, look, the, the whole thing there, I mean, if, if we should start there, this conversation. Uh, sure. The point I was making and continue to make, and it's the reason we're doing this podcast, it's the reason Rick Sanchez News exists, it's the reason Agua Media exists, is still we are 20% of the population of the United States and we are underrepresented. We make up less than 2% of the people on CNN and on Fox News. We're not even invited to the conversation. And phenomenally, here's the most bizarre thing of all. Yes, CNN once had a prominent Latino named Rick Sanchez. That would be me. I said something I wish I hadn't said. The point I was trying to make was that television news needs to be more diverse. And when they said, well, what about Jews? I said, Jews are actually very well represented. That doesn't mean they're represented everywhere, but in media, Jews happen to be very well represented, just like African-Americans are very well represented in hip hop and Cubans are very well represented in the politics of Miami. Certain people are well represented in certain areas. That's what I was trying to say, but I maggled my words, I screwed it up. But here's the point, here's the point. To this day, CNN never replaced me with another prominent Latino. There is not a, a prominent primetime anchor on CNN who's Latino or on NBC who's Latino or on Fox who's Latino or on any other network in the United States. So I think my point was right. Not just that. Look, I, I, I see there's a difference, okay? I, you know, I watch television, I consume media. You know, there, there are more Latino roles uh, in, in in television and movies. I think one of the biggest problems is that it doesn't go past still the majority of those roles being quote unquote negative roles, being yeah. the rapist, the drugs, the you know, because all of a sudden my friends come out and they go, man, we're going to read and look at this script. And I look and it's, uh, you know, 
it's a motorcycle gang. Okay, all right, that's cool. Mayans OC, I get it, great. <laughs> the, the majority of those characters are going to be negative characters. And yes, you compare it to, because, you know, I had a conversation with my friend the other day. He's a white guy. And he said, well, look, but they did that to us, you know, because this was born of Sons of Anarchy. So you had Sons of Anarchy. Well, how did that make us look? I said, it's different. It's different when the only president that we know is named Destabes, who changed his name to Sheen, yeah. who was on TV. That That's what we know from that representation. But it, Sheen, most people don't know is an Estevez anyway. So even the person who did that, you know what I mean? We talk about, wh what's that actor's name? The one from uh, Guatemala, Isaac uh, something? I don't know, uh, Jerry, do you know? He, I'm asking my producer. He usually knows all this. So kind of it's, stuff. Uh, he's a very prominent actor. His, his, I, I kind of want to forget his name because I love and hate what he did. What did he do? His name is Mar well, his name is Martinez, and I think it's Martinez, Hernandez, or something like that. But he doesn't go by that name. He goes by Isaac and then another name. But anyway, point being that the guy's got an unbelievable role. I mean, he's the Latino that, that flies the X-Wing fighter in the Star Wars movies. Uh, he plays Moon Oscar Knight. Isaac? Oscar Isaac. Yeah. All right. Oscar Isaac, the majority of young Latinos don't know that he's Latino. Hmm. And I think... It's very sad that, you know, when my son sees him. But it's not so much about the name, though. But it's not so much about the name. I'm okay <laughs> if he wants to change his name to something that he No, but what I'm cool. saying, my point well, to this how does is he, this. How does he wear his Latinoism? Does he talk about it? Is he proud of it? But he, he doesn't. My point is he took it out of his last name, and that helped. Yeah. Because that guy has been in so many movies, done so many roles, played so many different characters, played so many characters. He plays Moon Knight which is kind of wow. supposed to be, you know, a British guy from a, a kind of Middle Eastern heritage or something, which he might have. But my point is, is that he changed his name and he got rid of the Latino surnames in the back of his name. And because of that, I believe he's gotten a lot of work. What does that say? God, you're that right. When Listen, a Latino here's, what, here's what Wikipedia says about him. Known for his versatility, he has been credited with breaking stereotypes about Latino characters in Hollywood. He is an American actor, but the fact that they say... He broke care. I didn't even know he was Latino. Nobody knew he was Latino. He doesn't even play he, up the fact that he's Latino. But that's my point. He got rid of the Latino name and it <laughs> helped his career. So what does that say? They didn't see him as a Latino when he went in to read those parts. They looked at his face and they went, oh, Carlos Mencia can't do that. I don't think that I can go read for a Middle Eastern part unless I literally put on so much makeup that they didn't know. But then when they go Mencia, I'm sure they're going to go, no, 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 no. We need a, a Middle Eastern guy to play this. You know what I mean? Or, or, or that guy from New Zealand who's like in every movie and he plays Latinos all the time. Um, I don't mind that. Hmm. As long as you let the other side happen, as long as you let us play the president, as you, as long as the Martin Sheens happen. But those are so rare in comparison that hmm. sometimes, you know, look, look at this. I, I never claimed racism with regard to my situation. Mm -hmm. But think about <laughs> when Dane Cook, a white guy, gets accused of stealing jokes, it comes and it goes. Amy Schumer gets accused of stealing jokes, it comes and it goes. Mm -hmm. Carlos Mencia gets accused of stealing jokes in 2006, and right now, at this very moment, while this is being played and consumed, there is somebody saying something about being, being a joke thief, what, 16 years later? So it's hard for me sometimes to not go. So it's not racial? Yeah. At all? Oh, this has trust me. Nothing to do with race when there's comparisons? I Legitimate, gotta tell you. Straight comparisons? I gotta tell you, my friend. Uh, you know, I just, this reminds me because I just went to Wikipedia because you asked about this dude, uh, Oscar, and we couldn't come up with his last name. So right, I, Oscar Isaac. I Googled Guatemala Oscar and it came up Oscar Isaac, and I immediately started reading. And it looks like he has a very glowing a very glowing Wikipedia page. And Wikipedia pages are funny, I've learned. Wikipedia pages are not the truth. In fact, Wikipedia pages are usually bullshit. They're written <laughs> by people who either like you or don't like you. And if you're someone <laughs> right. like Carlos Mencia or someone like Rick Sanchez, they're not going to like you. 
If you're someone who is a Latino who has worn our Latinoism on our sleeve and has said things that sometimes have been controversial, they will attack you. I'll give you an example. If you go to my Wikipedia page, you will read nothing good <laughs> about me and everything bad that I've ever done from stealing bubble gum at the 7-Eleven when I was a cholo when I was like 12 years old right. growing up in the barrio, okay? I mean, right. it's all freaking there. I had a DUI 100 years ago. I uh, got fired by CNN. I said this. I did nothing about my interviewing President Obama or interviewing uh, Fidel Castro or Mikhail Gorbachev or Ronald Reagan. Nothing about starting, uh, you know, uh, Twitter and being the first one to use social media on television. Not, nothing, nothing. Everything is negative, 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 negative. And then I go to other people who work today at CNN and I see a guy who I know was caught in Central Park uh, looking for young men with a, well, let me just say it, a dildo in his boot and meth. And uh, you know what? In his Wikipedia page, that's maybe a sentence this big, this big. There's other guys <laughs> who've been fired from, our, from my media for lying. I mean, for just bold face saying things that weren't true. They get a little tiny graph like this. The rest of it is super positive. A guy like Carlos Mencia makes a mistake. A guy like Rick Sanchez makes a mistake. I go to your Wikipedia page. I think you're just a monster. I mean, and by the way, right. join the monster club over here. So basically, these places <laughs> like Wikipedia are bullshit. But everybody knows that. Look, people just want to believe what they want to believe. That's why it's difficult. I mean, look, it's, it's fodder for me. Right. It's it's I'll give you an example. Right now I go on stage and and it, and it really was. So my act right now was really born from uh, I was well, I was on my phone. I, I didn't know something. I was asking it a question. I was at Seattle International Airport at SeaTac. And this kid came up to me and he said, hey, I used to sneak downstairs and watch you and mind him and see when I was a kid. Yeah. He's in his 20s. And he said, you need to talk about how America has never been more racist than it is today. Yes. And I remember putting my, looking at my phone like, wow, you should be smarter than to say that. You actually have the smartest ability to be right here. And you're, you're, you can be knowledgeable like that by just asking a question and you would say something that stupid. Like, yeah, you can say there's racism. You can say America's been more racist. So. I looked at him and I was like, oh, so I need some workers. Where's the next auction? And he laughed and I went, bro, stop. Like make statements that make sense. And so it it made me go, you know what? I want to, I need to talk about this. You know, too many people watch too much news and really believe that America's broken, that America is all this and we're living in this negative. Hmm. And so I'm up there talking about how great America is, how we have fat, poor people, how <laughs> we go camping. We literally pretend we're homeless for a weekend. That's how good we have it. America's so easy that we literally sometimes want it to be harder than it is. Uh, uh, how diverse we are, how the most diverse corporation in the world is the military of this country. Uh, how amazing it is that we're the most inclusive country. We're the only ones that let you be hyphenated, right? You're either Mexican or you're not. You're either Cuban or you're not. You're either mm -hmm. Russian right. or you're not. Only America lets you be African-American, Mexican-American, whatever American. You know, we're we're the only country pretty much that during the winter, during the summer Olympics, when you watch the opening ceremony, we literally genetically look like leftovers from every other country as if we just don't have one of our own. But then toward the end, and then I talk about how all Americans are the same. Uh, anyway, this is, but there's this, this is, one part. And, and by the way, well, this, this is no hate, no fear. That's the tour that you're doing right now. Yeah, because I, I have no hate in my heart. You know, so many people look at my comedy from the way I deliver the material as opposed to the way the audience is laughing. So if you watch my performances and you don't hear anybody laugh, I can see how there's an intensity to what I say sometimes, an anger to it, a twist to it. But then if you add that laughter, all of that goes away because it's the point of, you know, what, like, oh, here's an example. I talk about where is the superhero Latino movie for us about a Latino for a Latino, right? Women have Wonder Woman, Asians have Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings, Black people have the Black Panther. So I'm talking about where is our Latino hero? Mm. And I talk about the recent movie, which was uh, the multiverse, uh, Doctor Strange. There was a little Mexican girl in that movie. She didn't have powers. She had abilities. 
and I'm not kidding you, I don't know if you saw the movie, bro. Her ability is <laughs> that she can go from dimension to dimension without being caught. So basically, the fucking Mexican can cross borders without being seen. <laughs> I can't. Are you seriously? <laughs> that's, that's really what it is. And yeah. so this is what we're talking about. Yes, it's a fun joke for me to tell. And yes, it's cool. But at the, on the other hand, that's real. That's my hero. When it came down, bro, I saw a, a poster for a movie called, uh, I think it was Valet Parker. Uh -huh. And I saw it and I went, oh my God, the, a version of that movie has been pitched to me since the early 2000s. Carlos, you're a Valet Parker. You're poor as hell. You're <laughs> parking cars, but you're really smart. And then you meet some white person who sees something in you and then they help you. And then with their help, you become what you want to become. And I'm like, okay, a Valley Parker, like that's the best character I can be. And then it's like, then it, I, I need somebody white, a white character to bring me to, to my apex to get my character. I don't know, man. Well, it that's so typical. Like you know, I've told this story before and you can find it if you go back to some of our podcasts, by the way. We're talking to Carlos Mencia. He is uh, on tour right now. It's called No Hate, No Fear, the tour. I think it's going to be in South Florida at some time, which means you and I are going to be able to have some, uh, spend some time together. I, I promise this time I will I will behave, by the way. I will behave. Oh, well, you, you don't, don't have be in to, Florida? Please. I don't, I don't like that anymore. I'm, <laughs> I'm too old for behavior, bro. I'm, I'm, look, that's why I put No Hate, No Fear. I have no hate. I want to make everybody laugh. That is truly my intent. Yeah. I have no fear. I'm not going to you, be You've been kicked around don't. a lot too. You know, one of the one of the things we do on this podcast uh and the reason we do this podcast Rick Sanchez News. Look, I'll be honest, I don't have to do this. I mean, I could just buy a 90-foot yacht and just go hang out in the Caribbean. Um, no, you and, couldn't. You'd you'd be over there watching your phone, look at the new news, <laughs> screaming at your employees. Yeah, you're telling right. People you're what's right. wrong with everything. You're right. You're right. I probably couldn't do something like that. But but the fact of the matter is, we do this because my God, if ever there's been a time to have some kind of Latino voice, it's now. This is crazy. Ever since we had this maniac in the White House saying that everybody who crossed the border was a uh, was a rapist or a criminal. It seems like the onslaught has begun against the Latino community. And I know, look, we can laugh about it because we know who we are. We know we're actually the third fastest growing economy in the entire world. We know we're the seventh biggest GDP in the world. We know we do more mortgages. We know we buy more cars. We know that 95% of those under 41 speaks English. 80% of us are American citizens, but nobody else knows this shit. So we have to sit there and watch these morons on all these cable channels. And Hollywood, which is the worst, according to the Annenberg study, go back and look at the podcast we did on that, uh, Myths and Lies About Latinos, or how Hollywood treats Latinos. Great podcast, by the way. And 37% uh, of Latinos in Hollywood are always cast as criminals. Another 32% are, are cast as losers, you know, like somebody who's never achieved anything. And that's just the way it is. That's why recently I went after Bill Maher when he started, you know, defending John Franco being cast as uh, Fidel Castro. And the, my point with to Bill Maher wasn't, it's, it's not, it's okay if a non-Latino gets a Latino role. The point we're making is Latinos always get shit roles. And when finally a good role comes around, you give it to John Franco, by the way, <clears throat> sexual predator, um, you know, I mean, come on. I don't know what well, you, this how do you feel one, about that? Right? I mean, this isn't the first one. You would know, you know, the, 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 the movie about the most popular Cuban name Scarface. Boom, now Al one Pacino. of us. Yeah. You know, so 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 you, you go back. With an Italian accent, by the way. I mean, in The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, a Jewish guy played the Mexican. I mean, you know. Uh, yeah. it, 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 wait, my, it, wait, my producer is saying happen. I screwed up James. What did I say? I said John Franco. All right. James it's Franco. James Franco. I know Franco. You're about. But, but look, the problem is, is that there's not enough of the opposite. Right. Mm -hmm. And that we have to theoretically get rid of our Hernandez in order for you guys to put us in a role where we're not seen as a Latino. And then you got you look, you got a guy like Trejo, right, who has who has made a career off of being, 
you know, a bad looking Latino character and that's great, but there's gotta be the other side. I and by understand. the way, by the way, we just, I just gotta say this because I, I, that was one of the freakiest thing that's ever happened in my life. You know, I'm in with Saul Trujillo and all these guys. And yeah. when I go out to LA, I get an opportunity to meet some of these guys. And Danny was sitting next to me and I was literally like, oh my God, I was looking at him and he, he looks as mean as he looks on TV, right? He looks scarier thinking, like, in person. Yeah, yeah. it's actually, you, you're looking at Danny Trejo and you're going, oh my God, this guy. And then you talk to him. He is what we would call un pedazo de pan. You know, yeah. a, a piece of bread. He is yeah. the kindest, sweetest, yeah. nicest, funniest human being you will ever meet in your life. Complete antithesis of how he appears on camera. Wow. Well, because if, if it wasn't for Hollywood, he would be in jail or dead. You know, if you talk to him long enough, he'll he'll talk to you about That's that. That's what he you says, know, he yeah. Was in his early life, something different. And because of Hollywood, and because of stereotypes, and because he fit a beautiful stereotype, he was able to be hugely successful, which is the other side of what we're talking about. I, I agree <laughs> that all actors should be actors, should be able to play anything. <clears throat> as long as we see ourselves, when we're 20% up and we're only 2% representation, that just shows you the big imbalance and there, there's missing characters. I listen. I remember not being able to watch way back in the day, Friends, because I remember thinking, and it wasn't even a Latino thing, but I remember thinking, "You're telling me that you guys are six people that live in New York and you don't have one Dominican or Puerto Rican friend? Seriously? <laughs> right? I, I don't know that that's that's impossible. That's literally impossible. But, but, and by the way, and I, I see that all the time in the media. You know, I'm I I sit around and I'll be I'll be watching a baseball game of all things a baseball game when we're where we're like what uh what, what would you say jerry where 60 percent of the people play baseball have to be either a puerto rican or a cuban or a venezuelan or a dominican or yo que carajo say afro latinos dominate that sport. jesus lord you watch these guys are great athletes and then you hear the announcer and they can't say gutierrez they can't say sanchez they can't even pronounce the name and i'm thinking so you get to be the announcer. There are no Latino announcers in a game where 60% of the guys are Latinos. And when you, when I see, whether it's a announcer at ESPN, morons, or a television host on uh, NBC or CBS or ABC, they can't pronounce normal Latino names like Guillermo without saying Guillermo or some stupid shit like that. That Will tells Lermo. me you know no one like me. You have never had a friend like me in your life. If you can't pronounce our basic names, then you know nothing about us. And you know what? That kind of pisses me off all the time. Just one of those little things that I'm going to share with you because I share it with my wife. Don't get mad at me. She does. She's but like, you just know watch what, the dude, TV I, I, and don't I, make comments on everything, you know? <laughs> so, well, you do, but but here's the thing. We're in this business. And look, and here's here's the irony of it. Right now, no matter what anybody thinks about what's, what they're hearing at this very moment, we're, we're not fighting for us. You're successful. You're yeah. doing well. I'm successful. Yeah. I'm doing well. Regardless of all the bad stuff, regardless of the negativity, regardless of the, the whatever rhetoric, whatever it is, we're doing well. And it's harder. When, when it, you and I are tell, talking about but, this, it's for those that come behind us. For but those let me that tell you something, Carlito. Struggling for the actual actor who's who needs help and isn't getting it, who didn't change their name, yeah. who didn't get rid of their, their last name, who is being looked at like that and doesn't, and goes, I don't know how to be a, a gangster that was never part of my life or whatever. Those are the kids that need the, I don't know if you know Anna Cabrera or what her thing is, but you know, more of that at least, you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, she's, well, here's the point. Yeah, and she's a, she's an anchor. They gave her the noon show, which is like the bottom of the totem pole show on CNN. It's like when no one's watching and they hope to be able to bring her up. But will they give her enough juice to be able to rise? I don't know. They used to tell me, you know, Rick, we see you more as a correspondent because that's kind of your place, something they've done in the past. But I want to talk to you about something, going back to your situation, which is really interesting, and my situation, because you and I are like, have lived kind of parallel lives. I grew up mm -hmm. poor as hell. My parents together, their income, maybe on a good year, taking my dad's three jobs, combining all of his salaries and adding it to my mom's, sewing shoes in a factory, they made maybe $11,000 a year combined income. So to say we were poverty level, my friend, we were poverty level, right? 
So I never grew up with a family lawyer or PR department. I never had any of these connections. So when guys like you and I go through shit like we did, I just got to find my way out of it. I got to either remake myself. I got to look inside of myself. There's no room for just being destroyed or calling daddy or mommy or <laughs> Uncle Joe and saying, hey, can you get me a lawyer? We just, we don't have that. So in, in some senses, that lack of infrastructure, that having to really get by on your own, it kind of makes you better. And when you do succeed, guys like you and I, who are kind of at the top of our game now, we look back and we said, I did this shit. I did this shit. I'm not Anderson Cooper, you know? I'm right. not a, uh, a uh, what the hell, what is his family? What is he? Uh, a Vander, I'm a not Vander. a Vanderbilt, okay? <laughs> I was going to say uh, Hamilton. I don't know. Are they a Vanderbilt I mean, or something like that? <laughs> Gloria Vanderbilt, right? His mom. But you know what I mean? You know what I mean? Yeah. It, it, there's something about being Latino in America today that fills me with pride because guys like us, man, we're making it. Nobody knows about it, but we do. Well, you know what the funny thing is, is that the best advice, even for Hollywood, I got from my mom and dad because, you know, who, who, who were the... First of all, we get pitted against each other. You know, people ask me about, you know, like dissension between popular comedians of Latino descent. And I was like, look, here's the thing. If uh, there are three Latino, four or five, ten Latino comedians that are all kind of within the same kind of range and there's a movie role or a TV show and it's for one Latino, guess what? Those ten guys are gonna be called in at the exact same time. They're gonna go into a room and they're gonna see each other. And they're gonna know, if I get it, they don't get it. If they get it, I don't get it. Yeah. And that competitiveness creates this distension because it's what you were talking about. It's not like, you know, well, you take this one, I'll get the next one, you know what I mean? Or what are you doing, Kevin? Oh, I'm reading for this role, but I got two other, you know, parts to read for, or, you know, for us, it's like, this is it. Holy shit, they're making a movie. There's a Latino character and he's going to be Ferdy Pacheco and he's going to be in the Muhammad Ali movie and this is going to be fire. This is going to be amazing. This is, oh my God, whoever gets this role. And so it might be Carlos. It, it, it might be Fluffy. It might be oh, right. it might, George Lopez. You know, and we're all there. We all know whoever gets it, their career is going to go and the rest of us are just going to sit down and look at them and go there for the grace of God. And because of the scarcity of these parts, then it becomes even antagonistic in between us, not on purpose. It's mm -hmm. just, you know that that's your competition and you don't have the luxury of saying, I'll get the next one. You can say that, I'll get the next one, but the next one might be in two, three, four, five, six, ten 10 years. You have no idea when that comes. And the Latino-ness of it, right, is because we're scattered. You know, you speak of Latino, I speak of Latino. What does that mean when they say Latino? Are they speaking of the undocumented immigrants? Are they speaking of the 80%? Are they speaking of the ones that purely speak English? Are the ones, you know what I mean? There's so many of us. Are they talking well, about the, the, I have said the this. Central American, the Latino, the Cuban American? Like, we, we need to become, you know, that's where the word ironically beaner came from. Because even back in the day, I would say Chicano. <laughs> Some people would get mad. I would say Mexican American. Some people would right, get mad. I would say right. Latino. Some people would get mad. I would say Hispanic. Some people would get mad. Ironically, of all the words being descriptive of our people, <laughs> comedically speaking, Beaner was the yeah. only one that didn't get a negative reaction. It seems inoffensive. It's the only one. Right. It's a bean. It's funny. It's the beans are funny. I, mean, went, yeah, I think of like farts beans. when like I think of beans, the only right? One I mean, right. Where nobody said, I'm not from Hispania. I don't speak Latin. <laughs> and so I think that. I think that a big part of what's happening here is that we don't have we don't have the power because we don't ask for it the way the African American community does. There's an infrastructure ready when a black American, you know, something happens with a cop and and it's out. Yeah. Dude, we yeah. already know the pundits that are going to come out and speak in favor of that or speak to that. We don't have that infrastructure. We, we don't have those people. We don't have those anchors, let alone those people. We don't have the Don Lemons of the world for that or, you know, whatever it is. We don't have any of that. And right. so we're kind of stuck just tooting our horn and some people follow, but other people don't. And, we, you know, another thing is we're I think it needed. starts. I think it starts, by the way, with Hollywood, though. I mean, I've always I've sure. said this on many of my podcasts that 
you know, people get angry at Fox News. People get angry at the crazy right these days. You know, the MAGA, the Trumpers, who uh, are literally uh, hell-bent on making sure all the Mexicans die or leave the country tomorrow. I mean, that's, it, that is their mantra. I mean, when their fearless leader, the very first words out of his mouth when he established himself as a candidate for the presidency of the, of the United States, and the very first words out of his mouth was, people crossing the border Mexicans are rapists and criminals. And then he immediately vaults to the top of the list among Republicans. That tells you right there, end of story. We needed no more. This is about that. It's about hating Mexicans. So this guy who built his whole candidacy around hating Mexicans and all the people who support him literally hate Mexicans. Nobody has to convince me of that. I mean, that's, that's unfortunately the America we live in today. But now I'm going to defend Donald Trump. And I'm going to defend those people. You know how? Oh. The thought was not put in their head by Donald Trump. Donald Trump and that that idea of what Mexicans are, lazy, uh, criminals, losers, you know, yard cutters, whatever the hell. But, but see, Hollywood but put that there. Hollywood first put that there, <laughs> you know? Yes. But on the other hand, think about what you're saying and the, the, the oppositional views of what you're saying. Lazy don't want to work, and yet they're taking our jobs. So even the narrative <laughs> of it doesn't make sense. Right. So I'm lazy and I'm jail and I'm sucking up, but yet I'm taking all your fucking jobs too? Right. So which one is it? The thing about Latinos is, unlike all of those groups, you look at their history, they came in within a certain amount of time, right? The period of time, a lot of them came in, they got, they got beat up, the mix got beat up, and then they were freed, you know? The, 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 every, everybody went through it. The problem with us is the influx of illegal immigration on a yearly basis doesn't allow for you and I to get past it and say, whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah, maybe my uncle swam here. That's not me. Um, that's not who we are. And we, we, so the stereotype gets, gets relived over and over again because it doesn't get past its time. It doesn't go past it. We can still do, mm -hmm. I can still right now do a movie and pitch it about a quinceanera where in my backyard we kill a goat and we kill chickens, <laughs> but we live in a homeowners association and you're not supposed to do that. And what occurs when my family does, you know, I guarantee you that right now there's somebody in Hollywood that heard that and went, oh, wow, that's a interesting, yeah, we can do something like that. Um, that's the problem. That the problem, the problem is, is, we can't step off of our own dicks to get ahead yeah. and, and we fight like you and I, we're fighting for our own people. I have Latinos that get mad when I do jokes like, uh, somebody told me that an illegal immigrant took their job and my reaction to that was, how bad was your interview? What did you say in English? <laughs> Like, like, literally, I, I tell a joke. There's this a lady, guy got here lady. last week and he took your job. What the hell does that say about you, right? Well, it, exactly. <laughs> it's that, listen, there's a lady that works at a McDonald's off of Route 17, right near the right near the state line between New York and uh, New Jersey. This is, her name is Maida. She's a Puerto Rican lady. She's a yeah. friend of mine. Her accent is so thick. I'm not even going to do the joke. I'm just going to tell you that when I met her, I ordered some a, a, a wrap sandwich and she said, creepy chicken okay so this bit about creepy chicken was born my whole point is she really exists she really said creepy chicken when i asked her what's the healthiest thing on the late night menu she said fallacial fish i'm not kidding you bro that's what she said and the interesting thing was in sounds the like car, a winner to friends, me my friends tried to get mad at her right and i said and this is why i'm the comedian and you guys are my friends and look up to me and they were like, why? I said, because you guys aren't taking the last step necessary in this equation. You're getting mad at her because she can't speak the language. You know who I'm mad at? And they go, who? I'm mad at every American that applied for that job and wasn't as good as creepy chicken and fellatio fish. Yeah. That's who I'm pissed off about. Because what you're telling me is that was the best applicant. The lady that said creepy chicken, fellatio fish, that lady was the best applicant. And yet she's the fucking problem. 
the one that wants to work, the one that's trying, the one that's giving her best. By by the she, way, that's so, the problem. Since you're the, the comedian, the American who went to school who can't speak a fucking lick of English enough to beat her, you're fired up. I love problem. this. It's, you know, since you're the comedian and, my, and I'm the news guy, I'm going to accentuate yeah. the point that you just made with some statistics. According to sure. the Forbes study, this is interesting, and you're going to love this. Latinos, on average, work 44 hours in a week. The average non-Latino, 33. Here's a better one. Latinos in the United States start more small businesses than any other cohort, according to Forbes, in the United States. Here's another one. Latinos in the United States hire more people than any other cohort in the United States. So once again, with those three stats, I just completely did away with everything that is believed about us and talked about every night by your friends who don't get us and by Fox News and all the others right wing nutties, uh, you know, uh, outlets out there. So you know, th this kind of stuff is kind of important. It's worth saying. I don't say it because I'm, oh, prejudiced. Oh, I'm, I'm cool with whatever you want to say, but it's, God, I wish somebody would be out there just telling our story a little bit. And I know it's meaningful for guys like you and me. That's all. But, That's it, but it is because, you know what? Listen, I know that we did the joke earlier, but when I talk about it on stage and I have time, um, look, it's not about it's not about me wanting to see, you know, the, the brown coyote or whatever our superhero <laughs> is. It's that, bro, I saw little girls running around the movie theater after they saw Wonder Woman. I saw the look on their faces. A movie made them feel like they could fly, bro. Yeah. A movie made them feel like they could accomplish anything. I was with my friend who was born in Liberia when we went to go see the Black Panther. And he doesn't have an accent. But I'm telling you, bro, during that movie, I looked over and he was so filled with pride. He was like, that is our people. And I was like, wow. Nice. I see that, the, the affect that it has. That's what I care about. I want my kids, not through just me as a father, but I want them to know that they're important and relevant in their society based on the mirror that society puts to yeah. them. I don't want my sons to only, you know, feel connected to, to our landscaper who comes in, you know, on Wednesdays and does the house and they go out there and speak Spanish to them. I want that connection to be beyond that. Listen, I just got back from El Paso, Texas. El Paso, Texas is hugely, disproportionately Latino. And yet the representative for Latinos today is still Beto O'Rourke. What does that say? You, you, I know that people have ran for office that are Latinos. I know people that ran for office and won for office. And yet they still have to fight the stigma, you know what I mean, of being Latinos in El Paso, Texas. This is the problem. You know, well, I want our kids to dream. And it's what you said. Where do we begin? We begin with the books that we open. I don't know who the fuck Dick and Jane are, but they've been in my vocabulary since I can remember. Yeah. I, I don't I don't know who they are, but I know that, that that's a big part of my donde, growing donde, up in life. Donde está Pepe? Donde está Pepe? Right? Right. It's like, and, and by and the way, by the way I, got, I got to do something real quick. So <laughs> yeah, to show people the kind of person that you are, and this stuff is always important. I love when people go back in my past and said, I once met Rick Sanchez and, you know, the day that I met him, he was a prick. Or, you know what? <laughs> he was actually a really, really nice guy. Came to speak at my elementary school or something like that. Right. So it just so happens as I'm getting ready to produce this show today or do this show, my producer, Jerry, says to me, I got a Carlos Mencia story. And I said, really? What the hell is your Carlos Mencia story? And he says, I want to share it with you. So, Jerry, you, we're not going to see Jerry. He's off mic. So don't talk forever, Jerry. I know how you Mexicans are. You can go on forever. <laughs> but do me a favor. T tell Carlos your experience with him and share it with the people we'll, who are listening. We'll do, boss. Carlos, how you doing, brother? How you doing, brother? Uh, so ironically enough, my nickname in high school was Filatio Fish, which is weird oh, that, we're, that we're just Dude, having this conversation. No, no, Did listen. You wow. say that? <laughs> I <laughs> hope to God it had nothing to do with me, bro. Oh, I'm so my sorry. No, 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 no. Okay. So back in the early 90s, before Carlos blew up, before he got Manda Mencia, uh, I used to work at an advertising agency, and he got hired to do a Sprite commercial. I really hope he remembers this. I do. We put him in a white studio background. In his Where was this? What city was this? In LA. In LA. Yeah, LA. And his line was, Animate. Remember, Carlos? Animate con Animate. Sprite. Animate. Exactly. Yeah. And, and we filled Sprite him in. Sprite es tu frescura en el calor. He remembers. Y exactly. el sabor de lime, tu animación. I, I wrote I that, brother. Yes. <laughs> Sprout my lines, kid. So... <laughs> 
<laughs> so we write the commercial for Carlos. By the way, this is going good so far. Keep it up. So we're doing the commercial, and Carlos, you know, he's great. It's a three-day shoot. We're all there. He's a young, up-and-coming comedian. He's not very well known yet, and he's so nice to all of us, and we're all hanging out with him. And at the end of the shoot, like it always happens, the bosses, the clients, they're all making plans to go this to go to this expensive Italian restaurant. Yeah. We're going to meet at this five-star restaurant, and I'm like, I don't want to go to dinner with those guys, man, you know, whatever. So all of a sudden, Carlos says, come with me. And he takes me, my partner, and my boss. In three, a limo? In a limo, because the, the company got him a limo. And you go to that party? No. He takes us to East LA to a taco stand. No! To a taco stand. <laughs> and we Look pull up. King Taco. That's right. And we oh pull my up, God! And we pull up in a limo, and all the raza is looking back like, who is, like, they think it's Ricardo Montalban showing up or something. <laughs> like, what's going on? And Carlos comes out. He buys us tacos. He buys us beers. We hang out the whole night, hanging out there with him that night. Everybody has a celebrity story. This is my celebrity story. Carlos Mencia, you are the man. And here's the punchline. Here's, here's the end point to that. Once we get dropped off back at the hotel, I look at my partner, Kat, and I'm like, bro, that's amazing. How did that happen? And he goes, simple. He's Latino. Yeah. If that would have been Robin Williams or some white guy, give it a shit about wouldn't it. even talk to me. But because yeah. he was a young, up and coming Latino, come on, let's go get some tacos. That was awesome. That's now, a great story. Now Thank let you. me That's... give you the other side of that story. So now you're you're fully, fully aware. Mm -hmm. I got a lot of shit for doing that because they thought that my arrogance didn't allow me to go hang out with them when it was my humility to take you guys. Yeah. That's number one. You remember number that? Two, really? I don't know if you I don't know if you remember this part, but I said, we're going to King Taco, and the guy, the driver goes, I'm not, I'm not going to East LA. I'm right, not going to East right, LA. Right. You guys are not, no. I'm, and I said, no, 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 it's not in East LA, bro. It's not wow. in East LA. It's in a really nice part. Don't even worry about it. I promise you we'll, we'll be good and safe. We were in East LA, by the way, in the heart of East LA. Yep. But he didn't know where it was. And so I just took him down the streets that were, you were you know, directing looked them. like yeah. any other street. And then we got there. So the, the driver didn't want to take us there. I had to lie about where we were going. That's right. And then the muckety mucks thought that I was arrogant because I didn't want to go to their party. You stood them up. In these to East LA. You so stood them up. I, I, it's what you were talking about uh, earlier, bro. You know, we get, we get misrepresented sometimes because people don't understand us. People, mm -hmm. did, you know, thought that my humility was arrogance. And it was, how the fuck am I arrogant? I'm taking them to eat tacos. Right. Seriously? Tacos are arrogant? I, I mean, it was just, you know, it's No, no, shit it, that it I, even I'm, goes back to your experience with, you know, people attacking you because they said you took somebody else's joke or something. And I hear people interviewing you and they're saying, well, you know, you're such a big guy up on stage and you're a bully and you're this and you're that. And I'm going, what? They, they, you know, it, it, yeah, say, yeah. That's, that's, I'm five foot nine, bro. The guy <laughs> that accused me of stealing that joke is six foot four. Yeah. And the guy who perpetrates it is, is an MMA kind of fighter. Seriously, that, that, that's who I'm intimidating. No, yeah. it's not. It's look, it's not that it's that it, look when, when you hear, when you go to a comedy club, any comedy club in, in America that I've performed in, ask them who has the record for going on longest. And it's going to be either me or Ralphie May. And Ralphie May and I had this thing where we said, hmm. we're going to do at least two hours a night because that's minimum how much it costs people to buy our tickets. The least we could do is give you those two hours that you had to work to pay for our tickets back. But <laughs> that has hmm. always been seen as arrogance. It, as something, oh, wow, well, he wants to go long. He, you know, there's always an excuse Hmm. for somebody else's success and for latino success we had to cheat we had to have cheated to get there it's got to be the case right it's got to be what happened but it's not and you know i i think that our our job is to not become bitter because once we become bitter then we're not the voices for the people anymore we're an easily ignored voice of somebody who's got a gripe with CNN because he got fired and that's what this is all about. And no matter what intelligence, no matter what knowledge, no matter what perspective comes out of your mouth, it becomes that quickly irrelevant. It, you know, that that's what they try to do to me. Carlos Mencia, I saw him last night. He was amazing. He did two and a half hours of just brilliant stuff. Whose jokes did he steal? Boom. 
Done. Yeah. Dead. Yeah. Who cares anymore? No, oh, I wow. Know. That wasn't his. You mean he he's brilliant enough to remember two hours, brilliant enough to perform two hours, brilliant enough to make them, but he can't write it? What? It just doesn't make any sense, but people want, you know, look. You know what's really it, cool, Carlos? You know what's really cool, Carlito? Um, they may have said whatever the hell they wanted to say about you. Well, I don't care. But now the joke's on them. As I hear you, as I see what's in you, as I see what you've become, as I see how you've conquered whatever the hell they tried to throw at you, really, I mean, you've turned this around, man. The joke's on them. Good for you. Well, I just did a special. I'm just doing another special. But you know what? You know what I do now at the end of the shows? I, I, I address I address how we like putting other people down in this society. And I tell them, I tell them, look, you can go online. And I'll tell you guys, you can go online and you will read a lot of negativity toward me, a lot of it from comedians, a lot of it from our industry. You know, you won't find me speaking ill of those who speak ill of me. And yeah. the reason I don't do it is not because I'm better than anybody or I don't feel the way you feel. I want you to do as I do, not as I say. And putting other people down, it does make you feel better. You know what it doesn't do? It doesn't actually make you better. So for all those people that think that calling me names or putting me down yeah. is going to make your comedian or that person that you think or you're that comedian who you think you, you're still going to have to work at it, bro. You're still going to have to make it. You're still going to have to write. You're still going to have to create. You're actually going to have to do the work, the work that I've done my entire life. And you saying that I do whatever, it doesn't make you any better. It doesn't help you in any way, shape, or form. Hmm. The only way you can do that is to keep working. It's what you did. Yeah. You know, we land on our feet, not because we're cats, but because there's no work that we won't do. There's no work that we won't, you know what I mean? They called you up and said, you're on CNN. You want to do some local AM radio show? Yeah. You didn't say I'm too good for that. No. You didn't say, oh, hell no. I'm going to fight until I get my. You said, mm -hmm. you know what? This is the way it happened. You know, my family, they were awesome in Cuba. Then communism came. Then we had to swim over here. And then all of a sudden, we were nobodies again. We were illegal immigrants. Everything that we did meant nothing. We worked hard. And now we're here. And now you just put another, you just put another Fidel in, in my, in my lane. I'm going to overcome him. Like I overcame everything else. And now you're where you're at. It, it's, it's, it's what we do, but it hurts us. Yeah. It hurts us because we don't complain enough. It hurts us because we just get up, dust ourselves off and go, all right, what's yeah, next? You, you know, you what make me doing think next? too of where's, you, where's you, my you, next show. I'm going to perform at Rothschild. What Appleton, Wisconsin, they have a comedy the, to, club there. To the when? assholes out there who do that and always are looking at the negative in all human beings and the ones who will say the things they say about you and to those who maybe want to say the things they say about me, about something I may have done or said 20 years ago, there is something <laughs> about looking at yourself and saying to that person, that imaginary person, if you had been in this situation, I doubt you would have been able to do what we did. I doubt you would have been able to lose everything and have every single news manager in the United States say, you will never work again and I'm gonna see to it. And suddenly you have to remake yourself. You have to get a job teaching at your daughter's elementary school for peanuts just so they can take half of her tuition deducted. You have to get a job at a small radio station. You have to do a job, get another job, third, doing something in Spanish at a small TV station. Suddenly, I mean, you do whatever you have to do to remake yourself and collect your money. And then, in my case, start a healthcare company that's now worth more than $4 billion, thank God. But doing that is the greatest achievement at all, of all. It, it's almost like, Carlos, I'm just thinking out loud here, but sometimes I tell people, I tell my sons and I tell my friends, if you haven't tripped recently, Find somebody and tell them to make you trip because it's in that falling down that you get up and you find who you really are. Right. It's so true. But, but, I found it in my experience. And as Latinos, we do that shit all the time. You know? But that's the point. We, we do it so easily because, you know, I still hear the voice of my mother. You know what I mean? God rest her soul telling me. And? Ike? Okay. So it's harder for you. So you had to walk because you don't have a car. And? <laughs> 
¿Y qué? ¿Y qué? Are you, are, so, so now you're not going to go to school? So okay, what? so go and make me some, go and make me some tamales. That's so I, I, Latino, I don't want to make tamales. Man. Oh, you don't want to be a tamale maker? Then you better walk your ass to goddamn school. You know, I mean, there was no excuses. There, there was no, you know, you know this. The, our parents never gave us excuses. They, they no. were, they, they, they worked hard. That's what they knew. They said, go to school, get educated, and get a good job. That's and it. you know, that was it. I mean, my family had an intervention for me when I started doing stand up. They didn't know what an intervention was, but they had one. I came home and my entire immediate family was at my house and they were there to convince me that I was an idiot because I have a degree in electrical engineering to do stand up comedy and yeah. quit my job. They, you know, they couldn't understand it. They were like, what are you doing with your life? You're right. an idiot. This is, <laughs> this is stupid. Thank God my father at the time was kind of a drunk and he started getting hammered and a lot of people talked. So by the time it got to him, he was like, if he wants to be a clown, fuck it, let him jump. <laughs> and thank God. Thank God. You know, and then a year later, a year and a half later, I get, I win Star Search in Spanish, right? They have a, on a Univision, Buscando Estrellas con the Univision. And uh, I won that in Spanish. And at the after party, my mom was like, when he was born, I saw the skies and there were stars. And I'm sitting back going, bullshit, bullshit. man, Richard, it's all bullshit. <laughs> you didn't believe any of this, any of this. You but grew up, by the way, you, I, I think um, you should know about Carlos. Grows up in Pedro, uh, uh, I'm trying to remember. Born in San Pedro Sula, Honduras, yeah. Yes, yes, Pedro Sula, Honduras, right? Um, Pedro Sula, yeah. Pedro Sula, thank you. And and the reason I'm I'm making sure I pronounce that correctly is that is the most dangerous city in the world. Yeah. The most dangerous yeah. city in the world. If you grow up there today, there's a good chance that if you have a daughter, she's going to be raped by she's 16. And if you have a son, he'll probably be killed or shot. That's how dangerous that city is. That's amazing. You're one of 18. And I'm the 17th of 18 kids. You were the 17th of 18 kids, Carlos. That's just that is remarkable. I am, I don't imagine you grew up in a penthouse or, you know, with uh, lots of TVs and uh, lots oh, of... Oh, I, I slept with a lot. Of, listen, uh, eight girls were born in a row before me, so I wore hand-me-downs. Uh, I wore blouses to school. Oh, nice. Um, I wore Jordache jeans to school. They didn't make those for men, by the way. And uh, <laughs> it was interesting uh, being a teenager, going to school, wearing my sister's jeans and having, uh, you know, hardened gangbangers tell me that I look good in these jeans, bro. That was, uh, that was an interesting part of life to hear. Hey, well, you look good in those jeans. That's it. Uh, that, that was an interesting upbringing, bro. But that's why, you know, that's my, why my your story is so great, man. That's why they never gave excuses. Yeah. Yeah. And when they criticize you for a few stupid things that, uh, may have been mistakes and it's okay because in life we're all imperfect and we all make mistakes. But, but you know what's case... funny about that, dude? I, I struggled with that for a long time. And let me tell you what of I found out do. recently. I was with a buddy of mine when we were amongst a lot of other comedians and he said, hey, I must tell you a story about Carlos. He goes, I went on stage one time, told a joke. Then Carlos went on stage right after that and told the same exact joke and he killed it. That's how good he is. And I said, bro, that's how rumors get started. That's you can't do that. You can't, I can't go on and repeat a joke that you told that doesn't work and then make it work exactly the same. It just doesn't work that way. And I go, what joke was it? And he goes, it was when I was talking about how my mom disciplined me. And I, I immediately remembered, I went, yeah, you talked about how your mom hit you with a wooden spoon and how bad that was. Then I went up on stage and I said, speaking of, and I said, Willie, I said your name. I told them what you did. And then I talked about how my mother used to hit us so bad that one time we had bruises and then th we got called to the police. And th so my mom basically was told that she could never ever hit us again or she would end up going to jail. And then six months later, she, I forgot that this whole thing had gone down. We went to go buy my clothes in uh, Tijuana, Mexico. And as soon as we walked over the bridge and passed that little red line, Every single bad thing that I had done from that point until then, she beat my ass on that bridge, letting me know that she will take me to Mexico or Honduras to discipline my ass yeah. if need be. Um, and he said, he said, yeah. And I go, dude, those are not the same jokes. Those are the same premise. Those are my mom hit me. My mom hit me. But those are not the same jokes. Yeah, don't say it's goes, the same joke. I've got enough of that already. Okay. It's exactly. I'm up to here with point. that already. Right. Exactly. That's what that's what all that stuff was. And so now what you're seeing is 
of freedom. You know, it's funny. I record all my shows and I have since 1994 and I was on some radio station and uh, I was talking or a podcast. No, it was a radio station. And this guy said to me, you know, like, hey, bro, what about those accusations? And I said, look, if you're going to do that to me, bring the person on. I record all my shows and we can just discuss this. I can literally go back and go, oh, my God. Yeah, you wrote that joke before me. or Oh, my God, I wrote that joke before you. And he goes, oh, come on, bro. And I said, wait a minute. I just told you that I have evidence of when I've done something and you're saying that that means nothing to you. No, that's so and typical he's like, today. But yeah. You know why? Because today it's not about truth. It's about feelings, right? Mm -hmm. It's like I do a joke about baristas and I say, I don't call them baristas. For centuries, blacks and Latinos have been making coffee. Juan Valdez was a proud coffee maker who showed you his donkey. But now that it's white people at Starbucks, yeah. I'm a barista. Well, but, but it's amazing. I grew up, you know, we're Cuban. So in Miami, there was a little kiosquito at every corner in South Florida. Every right. every drugstore and every supermercado had right. a little kiosquito where you would go. And with 10 cents, you would buy a little Cuban coffee, right? Right. Today, you go to Starbucks, that same thing is $3. They literally took our idea and took it national and good for them. But it's like, my God, do you really need to charge so much money for a cafe con leche just because you're calling it Ole or some bullshit name and giving it some other uh, bizarre tag? It's just the weirdest thing in the world. But not just that. Like that, I can live with. But the fact that I'm a coffee maker, but you're a fucking barista. Right. Like, really? Right. Yeah. Like, you're even going to, you're going to take the job that I'm doing and then demean me at the same time, you're still shitting on me with it. <laughs> that, 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 that is, that is the, the issue, right? It is going back to, again, your name, my name leads people in this country, a very specific segment of people to believe that we're dirty, taking, robbing, thieving, stealing from America, and that we give nothing to it. And at the end of the day, I had a conversation with the guy. I said, look, I'm about to give you a bunch of statistics on why immigrants, period, are important in this country, illegal, even more so. And then you're going to tell me how you feel and nothing's going to change because it's about how you feel. Exactly. And I can't help that. Right. I can't help I, the feelings. I, 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 well, I feel like they're doing it. Well, I don't care what you feel like. I'm telling you what the, the numbers are. These are the facts. Are. Exactly. I'm telling yeah. you the billions of, of, of people that work in this country that don't file for taxes at the end of the year because they're using somebody else's Social Security. Number, and that gets just, just, just stays in the system. So those whatever billions of dollars just rotate and stay in the city, just all of that. You can retire and collect Social Security because somebody, as you would say, a beaner took care of that for you. So what you should do is appreciate them, not be criticizing them by staying up watching Hannity all night long. By the way, uh, these are Latino experiences. These are Latino stories that we've been sharing. And that's why we do this particular podcast. It's called Rick Sanchez News. Do me a favor. Don't only make sure you watch it or watch the next episode when it comes out, when we have another conversation with someone like a Carlos Mencia. I doubt there's anybody like Carlos Mencia, but if you know what I mean. Uh, but tell people, tell your friends, send it to somebody, share it. Right. Go to Spotify, go to Apple and share it with somebody by putting it on Twitter or sending it or email it to somebody. That's really important. And if you happen to be watching us, of course, on uh, if you happen to be watching us on YouTube, uh, subscribe. OK, subscribe. That's that's really, really important for us. So there you go. Huge. Have it. Yeah. Huge. Yeah. I mean, that's we're all we, we, we've only been doing this for like six, seven weeks and we've already got a million views, which is pretty darn good. So. Huge. There are people out there. It's just tough to, you know, we got to get to them and let other people know. And eventually we can start this conversation just like the Beaner and the Redneck and I once had on CNN. I hope so, man. I, I You know, what I'm seeing right now is people are gravitating toward uh, the essence of truth. My My act right now is really about revealing those truths to people. And if I feel like, like uh people are really listening you know where are you people gonna be really... where, where, where are you gonna be next I, we should probably oh my uh... god i'm all over just go to carlsmencia.com like i never stop Got I, it. I can't because you know i take a week off and i'm i'm crawling out of my skin because something will happen you know <laughs> you're and such I'll go, a burro. oh god i gotta talk you're about such this. a burro oh my god gotta work gotta I, work I, gotta work
Yeah. Like I have, I, I, but it's more about, I need like, you know what? Here's, and I really mean this by the way. Yeah. I believe all Americans are pretty much the same. When you get rid of the stupidity of people trying to tell us, you know, you could do better. You know, who's up to blame those people? You should be doing better. You're not doing as good, you know, but when you get rid of all that, here's how I believe. And I know all Americans are the same. Cut back to March of 2020, bro. When they told Americans to quarantine. I don't care where in this country you live, race, creed, color, socioeconomic, political status, age, doesn't matter. Here's how you know all Americans are the same in a very weird way. When they told us to quarantine, bro, every single American had the exact same creepy thought. Oh my God, I'm going to shit a lot. Let's get toilet paper. Yeah. <laughs> I've never and quite you know heard that it stupid that joke. Way. I've never quite but, heard it described that way. But you're right. that stupid joke connects yeah. in such a beautiful, visceral way because it gets rid of all the voices that you hear from the left or the yeah. right. It immediately leads you to your house where you went. We need to stock up on toilet paper. Mm. And it's a beautiful moment where people are looking around laughing, going, oh, my God, he's right. I gotta there's some... this connective tissue, and there's not enough of that going on well in said, what my we friend. do because of niche marketing. Because we're not today about unifying. Think about back in the days, right, when we used to what, – what, where's the street where, where they do – there's a street in, a, in New York where they do all the advertising. Um, Madison Avenue. Madison Avenue. So back in the day, Madison Avenue, right? They did commercials to try to get everybody to like that thing. How can we get everybody to like Fruit Loops? Today, the marketing is how can we market to African Americans who went to college for two years oh, yeah. but then dropped out? You know, everything well, is so I mean, it's the news, right? That I it's mean, divisive. Fox News is there for angry white men who dislike Hispanics and African-Americans. And MSNBC now programs to African-Americans who dislike white men for disliking them. So we don't do the news in America anymore. We do the news for a specific type of person who's wanting to hear their message retold to them. And that ain't news, my friend, but that is where we are. That is where well, we are, unfortunately. I, here's what I tell people, the difference, right? And I'll do it here on camera. Back in the day, before newstainment, this is how people that read the news used to look. Very stoic, very, today, there's three pictures. There's this guy, this guy, and there's this. <laughs> and it's like, what the fuck are these people talking about? They're so animated. How much coffee and did you give that dude, man? Or cocaine? Oh right, because God. because they're because it's not they're not giving you who white one where when. Now it's all about their opinions. Yeah, and a yeah. lot of people don't know the difference between opinion and news. Right, the first five minutes might might be news. I'm okay with opinion. What, what I'm not okay with is bullshit. And half the time, that's all they're saying. Because but that's what opinion is, right? Because I mean, an opinion is just your take on whatever that is. And you can, you think, can have you an know, opinion and say, based on the fact that it's rained for the last three days, I bet there's a possibility it could rain again this morning. That's right. a fair opinion. But if your opinion is something to the effect of I hate black people. Or right. let me tell you what black people are like, or let me tell you what, right. you know, whatever. I mean, I'm, I'm pulling this out sure. of my butt now, but I mean, this is it. I mean, it's just, it's literally But people want to believe true. that. They it's, want to believe that. That's what you get. Yeah. They, if it wasn't them, it would be somebody else. If it wasn't Trump, it would have been somebody else. Yeah. Look, I tell people on stage when they, somebody yelled out the other day, well, explain Trump to me. I said, Okay. We had a black president for eight years. As a country, we thought we were ready. We obviously were not. Mm -hmm. Shit got a little weird. And orange is the new black. And and with those all, and with those words, we say thank you to my friend. <laughs> <laughs> and orange is the new black. You know, you have a way with words. Anybody told you that? I bet so. Somebody, um, somebody. <laughs> Carlos, thanks, my friend. Carlos Mencia, old friend. Hadn't talked to you in quite a while. 
It's great to see you. Been a minute, bro. If you come, you still are you still in South Florida? If you come to South Florida, yeah, we got a ranch out here. We got little caballos and everything. It's very nice. No way, dude. Do you really? Can you ride? Yeah, yeah. We got burros just like you, so we can come here. Oh, I'll get I'll get on a burro. I used to all my life when I was a kid, so I'll do it again. Not a problem. If you come to South Florida and I find out you were here and you don't call me, and I know that my phone is. I will. I swear to God. I swear to God. I will. You call me, and I'm gonna have you out here, and we're gonna hang out. Okay. Be good, my friend. God bless you. You too, brother. Hasta luego, bueno. dale. Bueno, boy. This is Agua Media, and this is Rick Sanchez News. Agua.